Hi guys. Um, so it's just sort of quite interesting coming here this morning. I got a phone call at um, seven o'clock telling me that my sister-in-law has just had her baby. So you guys are what's standing between me and Hutt Hospital at the moment, just to preface <laughs> that. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm quite keen to get this done. I'm not really, I'm looking forward to it. But um, yeah, that's where my mind was this morning at 7 a.m. Um, and actually I have a confession to make. So when I was first asked to, to come along and do this, I was like, ah, oh, I love internal comms. I could talk about it for hours. It'll be really easy. It'll be fine. Come along and tell what I know and what I think, and, and it'll it'll be awesome. And then when I sat down to write this presentation, I was like, I suppose there's going to be a whole lot of people expecting something really insightful and really knowledgeable. And actually, if I'm if I'm being really honest, I think internal comms is probably one of the easiest comms um, kind of things to do. And the reason is that it's really just about people, and it's really about what people want to know and what's valuable and meaningful to people. Um, and I actually find myself asking questions like, what would I want to know if I was in this situation? What, what would I want someone to tell me if I wanted to, to be informed? And anyone can ask themselves that question. You know the people, your volunteers, your, your members, your, your staff, you know them the best, you know what you're sharing. So actually, even though you may be expecting big wow, actually at the end you might go, ah, oh, that makes really logical sense. And that would be a good thing if you came away with that. So um, a little bit about myself. So. Um, I, for the last sort of eight years, have been working in comms um, in Wellington. Uh, I started out at Ronald McDonald House, um, where I spent a year doing uh, comms and PR for them. Um, I did uh, two stints at uh, the Earthquake Commission in Wellington. Um, I worked for a consultancy called Senate Communications for a little while, um, which meant I got to try my hand at lots of different organisations. Um, and then I was at Contact Energy before um, I joined Z earlier. Uh, earlier this this year. Um, so today, sorry, we're just doing manual manual clicking. Yeah, there we go. Um, today, obviously, uh, you would have seen in the kind of uh, blurb about today what we're going to cover. But I just want to talk about what internal comms is, um, why it's important, why it's valuable, how how to communicate internally. I know that seems really simple, and actually, there's some practical stuff in there, but it's. it's Again, like I said, it's not groundbreaking, it's just some really good principles and things to think about when you're communicating. Um, and I've got a couple of stories. I've said here of what goes wrong, actually one of them is an example of what happens when it goes right. But just, if that's all you take away at the end is kind of uh, internal comms and practice, then that's really useful as well. So, I wanted to start with uh, some assumptions, uh, which I guess are kind of human needs and actually probably underline a lot of what internal comms is about. Um, so hear me out, there's kind of a, a progression to this, this journey, but some assumptions first. So people want to feel valued. Uh, we all want acknowledgement for the work that we do. We want to be noticed, to be complimented, and we want for our successes or for even for our struggles to be seen and appreciated. Sometimes the simple human courtesy of saying thanks actually goes a really long way, and it can provide payback for a really long time. There's two. Um, we all want to understand what's going on and why. So we want to be informed. We want to understand what the, our organisation is trying to achieve, what the target is, where it is. We want to try and hit it as, as simply and as often as possible. Do we know what our organisational community group is trying to achieve? Do we know what sets it apart from other similar organisations? What makes it special? What's our organisation's history, its legacy? Who are our leaders? What motivates them? And what's important for the community group or organisation to achieve what it's set out to do? Thirdly, we all love being part of something valuable. Now, this is interesting, right? So most of what I'm saying today could be work like paid work or it could be volunteer or both. But actually, this is an interesting one. So with employees, there's kind of a, an expectation that you're paid to go to work, right? And it doesn't necessarily make you the most engaged person, but there is, <coughs> there is something that you're getting out of that already and that's why you get up every morning because you're expected to and because someone's paying you to do a job. And not-for-profits and volunteering, you don't have that. Right, so people are giving you their time over and above what they're already doing in their day-to-day -day lives. They've got families, they've got paid work to do, and this is something that they're doing in addition to that. The flip side is, people have come to be a part of your organisation because they believe what you're doing. And it's meaningful to, meaningful to them, and it's valuable, and they get something out of it. So there's kind of a double-edged sword. They're not there because they're being paid to be there, but actually because they inherently really believe in what you're doing. Um, so you kind of need to leverage that. So... Uh, 
just talking, yeah, volunteers are giving up the extra time over and above their nine to five jobs and their family lives. So knowing that, that those sacrifices are in pursuit of something valuable and meaningful is hugely, hugely important. Do we understand and believe in our organization's mission or goal? Do we see it having the positive impact we want? Are we seeing others helping to achieve it? And finally, and this is, hey? Yes, then there's one more. Yeah, perfect. Um, finally, we all want to feel connected. So role satisfaction, and this is at work or volunteering, um, comes from the ability to contribute, from being listened to, from, from being part of something tangible, worthwhile. Satisfaction comes from knowing that we all have a role to play and knowing that we're expected and encouraged to do our bit and to do it in the best way that we can. So if we look at those kind of simple human needs and we think about satisfying them, then the paybacks are really clear and kind of easy to, to see. So enhanced job satisfaction. Again, this is paid or volunteer work. It doesn't matter. When people's human needs are satisfied, they, they enjoy what they're doing more. Um, retention of good people. People feel valued, they want to keep coming back, they want to keep doing what they're doing. There's something in it for them because they feel good about what they're delivering. Positive impact on productivity and efficiency. I think we won more ahead, sorry. Um, so this, again, whether it's a not-for-profit or a paying business, it actually makes no difference. Productivity and efficiency are really important. In fact, even more so sometimes in a not-for-profit when you're making do on smaller budgets, sometimes no budget at all. Um, and enhanced customer service. Now, customer should really be in inverted commas because obviously customer is a very loose, uh, a loose term. Customer could be whoever's at the end of whatever you're trying to do. So it doesn't mean that they're paying you for a service. Um, I was talking to my colleague Hayley this morning and I used an example. If you are an organisation that knits jerseys for dogs, then your dog might be your customer at the end, right? Because they're the people that benefit from what you're doing. Okay, so don't, don't get caught into the, the, the simple version of the term customer. But ultimately, when people are satisfied in what they're doing and they're enjoying what they're doing, then what they're delivering at the end is, is better. So if we take those first two slides kind of to be true, then to me there's three key roles of internal comms. It's about communicating three things. The first being, here's what's going on, here's what we're doing, and why. So this goes back to my earlier point about wanting to be informed, wanting to understand what our organisation is trying to achieve, and trying to understand what and where the target is so we can focus on hitting it as, soon as, as often as possible. Often we fall into the trap of thinking, huh, but this is obvious, everyone already knows why we're here. But it's really important to remember that people don't carry organisational goals around in their head. They, new people start, experienced people take on new roles, uh, people hear some parts of the story but not always the whole story or they hear it in a different way or from a different person or at a different time. Social media, traditional media are full of varying forms of the truth. So really leaders and those at the head of any organisation have a really important goal to relentlessly tell the story of what is going on and why it's important. The second thing is telling people here's how we, here's how we do things around here. So internal comms gives a real opportunity to convey evidence of tangible leadership. So it's an opportunity for those leading and guiding an organisation to see and be seen. Internal comms can deliver examples of values in action, key principles being delivered on, people making a real difference, delivering on important aspects of the organisation's purpose. Talking about and sharing all of these things highlights what attitudes and behaviours are encouraged and valued and supported within the organisation and, by default, which ones aren't. And finally, probably the most important thing, thank you. So thank you and keep going. Say thank you, say thank you again. Tell people that their efforts are appreciated. Remind them that they're having a positive impact, which is what they set out to do. Encourage people for their hard work and encourage them to keep going. Better still, motivate them to, work, to do even more. So getting it right. Uh, often when it comes to comms, Focuses for organisations can be primarily, primarily external. And it, that totally makes sense, right? So new contacts, new prospects, broadening your customer bases, increasing your number of stakeholders that support the organisation, new donors, businesses wanting to donate, ma donate money, time or goods in kind, new volunteers, and media and community leaders who are helping to build an enhanced reputation in the public space. Surprisingly, talking to our own people or even to your business partners and helping them to talk to their people has given less attention, occasionally ignored altogether. Yet internal comms is about creating and nurturing an environment that encourages achievement in all of those spaces by informing and motivating staff so that they can function as your ambassadors 
defenders and contributors. So I'll explain a little bit more what I mean about, about those terms. So your own people, your employees, your volunteers, your business partners, uh, all have their own networks. Okay, so every day they go out and they talk to their family, they talk to their friends, they talk to their paid work and colleagues, sporting groups, spiritual and cultural groups, community groups, th the list goes on. They talk and they often ask for their opinion. So what do they say? Do they feel able and confident to promote the organisation and the work that you're doing? Do they, are they armed with a handful of great stories? So when someone asks them what's happening, what you've been up to, that they can just spread off a couple of great new initiatives that, that you're working on. Using internal comms to inform and engage your people turns them into ambassadors for your organisation out there in their own communities. When you're working with small numbers and, and less money, your network is, is your friend, right? Everyone has something to say and they've got a whole lot of people that they can be talking to about what you're trying to, trying to do and achieve. Um, at times, you could find yourself under pressure. So from within, possibly externally, uh, the media, political <coughs> stakeholders may be taking a crack. You might be trying to drive the kind of change in your communities that results in some criticism. Uh, you may be confronting challenging operating conditions, which are leaving you vulnerable or perceived as, as poorly performing. By empowering your people, you'll be created in defenders of your organisation and the work that you do. Disempower, confuse or demotivate people, and they'll probably say nothing. Or actually worse, they might join in. And finally, pe people at all levels and all roles, doing all manner of things, all have the potential to contribute ideas that can improve your organisation's performance, efficiency and well-being. Quite often, in fact, those frontline people are living in your organisation better than leaders are. They're on the front line, they're talking to customers, customers, they're talking to business partners, hearing what stakeholders are saying and doing. Provided you're truly prepared, and this is an important point I'll talk about more later, but provided you're truly prepared to act on the contributions that people make, then they have the potential to be con true contributors to what you're trying to achieve. So how well are you tapping into that? Sorry, I was told to put it on me and I was like, how do we fight on the podium? And then I knocked it off. <laughs> Um, so some principles, because actually it's kind of like, cool, I get all that, that makes sense, now how do I do it? Like I said, not groundbreaking, but, but hear me out, hopefully it, it all makes sense. So the first thing I'll say is that successful internal comms needs to be grounded in the values of your organisation. So Z's a really interesting organisation in that it's um, devout, can you be devout about values? I suppose you can, devout about the organisational values and um, it's not just something that's written on a piece of paper, on a poster on a wall <coughs> and that someone established once upon a time and we believe it, but actually it's inherent in everything that we do. And so two specifically come to mind when I'm talking about internal comms and they are share everything and be straight up. Really simple, like human needs, basic, you know, it's, it's not complicated at all, but it really helps us to inform the things that we say and share with our people. So. When we're saying something, we often find ourselves, I've been meeting some people say, that doesn't, that doesn't feel very straight up. How could we say that in a different way? And that will actually inform how we communicate. And I should also say, when I say share everything, it is not an open book, okay? And that's not a practical way to look in an organisation. There are always t times or uh, situations where you can't tell people everything. Um, but you can tell people what you can and why you can't tell them the things that you can't. So uh, when I wasn't there, but... When Z became a listed company, the CE went from being in a position where he pretty much told everyone all, all the numbers, all the financial performance, the works. Um, and when they became listed, he basically said, uh, rules mean that that's changed slightly, and I can't be as open as I used to be. So I'll tell you what I can tell you, and I'll tell you what I can't and why I can't. So I can't tell you that because actually the rules of being a listed company mean that I can't share those things. Sure, it's, it's some missing information, but at least people understand the reasons why, which is really important. Always be authentic. So this is hugely important. So even in a really big organisation, well, it's not huge, but big organisation like Z with people who are busy, our C still writes his own internal comms. So he writes a blog every week and he writes it himself and no one in the comms team has any oversight over what he says. Lucky he's a good writer. But <laughs> um, Even our GMs actually are the same. So we support them and we help them and we help them to communicate better and sometimes they need support, but actually they need to say it in the way that they would say it and they need to communicate with people in a way that would be authentic for them otherwise people, people see through it and it's meaningless and then it just sounds like someone else has written something that, that hasn't, isn't authentic, it doesn't come from the person who, who would have shared that. So this third one's a little bit contentious so I'm not sure everyone would agree with me but I, I am passionate about this and that's about staff first. So when, when I get to my examples in the end I'll 
talk about examples when staff haven't been told first, and I don't think it works well. So even if it's a minute before something is public externally, it is so, so important to tell your people first. Because as soon as someone rings, someone rings, and the worst thing ever, you open the paper, you see something about the company or the organisation you work for, good or bad, or, or even worse still, a customer, or someone rings up or pops their head in and says, oh, interesting, this, that and the other, and you're going, hmm, I didn't know about that. I've got nothing to say. I don't know what our position is. I don't know, I don't know how to share my views on that, because actually it's the first I've heard of it. No matter how good a liar you are, it is impossible to, to cover that when someone asks you or confronts you with that. So start first. Stick to your commitments. So early when I was talking about things that you can't tell people if there are stuff, that, things that you can't share. So sometimes you might say something like, this, this has happened, um, this is what I can share at the moment, and I'll come back to you in a week's time to tell you where we're at when we've learnt more. So there's a commitment there that you've promised to go back to your people and tell them more when you've got more to tell them. Go back to them and tell them. Even if you go back in a week's time and say, absolutely nothing has developed and I've got no more to tell you, but I promised you I'd come back in a week, so I'm coming back in a week. Because as soon as you don't meet those commitments, people don't trust you and you've lost their trust. And the next time you promise to come back, or if I did know something I'd tell you, people go, mm, yeah, maybe, maybe not. Internal comms is everyone's job. So this is an interesting one, right? So in big organisations, we have people that are actually ded dedicated to being internal comms people. But the old days of kind of barking out messages or emails have gone and it doesn't work. Nowadays, internal comms is about... It's about creating an understanding and knowledge and helping to build a collective responsibility for good internal communication. And it's encouraging everyone, everyone to have a, a space. And this kind of leads into my next point about, actually it's the last point, but about two-way communication. So simply firing out an email is not enough. Because I see it, I get it, I read it, and I'm like, but I've got questions, I want to know more, I've got an idea, I've got something that I've heard something different, where, where do I go? Where do I feedback? There has to be a way to feedback. Sometimes you get nothing, and that's fine. But you've opened up the, the, the two-way lines of communication, which is really important for people to feel really heard and valued. Um, and I will highlight that internal comms is not a replacement for inter interpersonal communication between managers and their teams. So it very much supports that, but actually face-to-face -face will always win out. And actually, I often relay this story, but when I worked at Ronald McDonald House, there was about eight or nine of us that worked, paid, paid workers that worked every day. And every morning at 10 a.m. we had coffee. Like made in a plunger in the kitchen and we all sit down around a table and sometimes we'd talk about stuff that was interesting and work related and sometimes we'd talk about completely unrelated stuff. But it created a sense of, of community among us, but also it meant that everyone heard everything. So when there was something to share, we could all share it together, we could talk to it together. It's, it's, not, it's not rocket science, it's not complicated, but it just gives a group face-to-face -face time. If something comes up in between or if it affected like a vo our volunteer database who, who aren't there day to day, that's when you can support it with written, written communication. But face-to-face -face will always win. So, all that aside, tell me how. So some practical advice. So my first point would be to cater to your audience. So if you work for an organisation, the majority of whom in your database are 17 to 25, and they live in big cities, and they've all got iPhones, then, yeah, using a Facebook community group might be a really great idea because it's using a channel that they like. Hey, better still ask them. So sometimes we've got information we want to share with you. How best would we communicate with you? T tell me how and we'll use those channels. Equally, if your community group is knitting jerseys for dogs and they're mostly over the age of 70 and they live in rural areas, Facebook's probably not going to be the way to go. And, you can, and there's no harm in saying, hey, look, we're just, we want to hear from you. Tell us how, how best to communicate with you and we'll, we'll, we'll cater to your needs. That leads me to my second point. You can use more than one channel to communicate with people. In fact, you can use as many as you like. As long as you are consistent in your messaging, tell people in all sorts of different ways. Tell them in a print newsletter that they get once a month that wraps up everything. Tell them in an email bulletin. Tell them in a Facebook group. Tell them face-to-face. -face, get your team together once a week. Whatever you want to do, whatever works and is, and is working for your people. But as long as you're consistent, you can... You can use as many channels as you like. There's no kind of sense that you have to go out and pay for a big campaign monitor account and pay out to send out a whole lot of emails. If It's actually more about what you're saying than the channel that you're using to say it in. And you could save the nice, big, shiny newsletter you want, but if you're not telling people anything that's meaningful or valuable, then, then it's pointless. 
Consistency is key, so that kind of goes to my first point. Use as many channels as you like, but say the same thing. So make sure you're telling everyone the same thing all the time. And, and again, even if you think, oh, but that person's going to get both of these messages, actually it doesn't matter, let people self-select. Some people might skim through an email and get the, the final points, but when they get a, you know, a nice hand-delivered you know, print newsletter that they sit down with a cup of coffee and read for an hour, that's a whole different kind of communication experience. But as long as you're saying the same thing, that's fine. It's less about how and more about what, so that comes to my point about channels. Again, it doesn't matter how you say it so much as what you're saying and that it's valuable and meaningful for people. Ask for feedback. There's a caveat to that, which is my next point. Ask for feedback and do something with it. So there is nothing worse than saying, we really value our members, we want to know what you think, give us your suggestions. You get a whole lot of stuff in, do absolutely nothing with any of it, and then a month later you ask them the same question, because people are going, but I gave you all these really great suggestions and I never heard anything. Am I meant to make them again? Do they, do they go into a vortex? Were they, were they rubbish suggestions? Um, and also acknowledging what people have said. So hey, look, we got over 100 suggestions from our members last month. Um, five we've already implemented, they were already in, in train, these are them, they're working really well. A couple of things that we'd love to do, but haven't got the budget to do right now. Sure, we'd love to give everyone 20 weeks leave, but you know, financially that's not going to work. You, you know, you can tell people why you can't do things. You know, there's no harm in saying no and or no because. Um, but go back to them, whatever you do. Go back to people who've made suggestions because they'll stop making them if you don't. Um, repeat. Repeat, repeat, repeat some more. And if in doubt, repeat again. So you can never say something more than. No matter how many times you think, you think I've said the same thing a hundred times, but actually there'll be someone who's missed all of the emails and all of the invites to come in and have a cup of coffee and all of the letters you've sent them, but if one time something gets through to them, then, then that's been successful. Um, so, some examples, which I had a note on, which I was throwing my little... Um, so, actually before I did this part, when I was doing this um, presentation, I actually went on to Google. I was like, there must be some really great examples of internal comms fails out there. I'll just read up on those and I'll share them. Not, not plagiarising, but I'll tell you that I Googled them and found them. And actually there was none. Like most of them were kind of I was like, oh, I don't really call that, that I, I don't know what the learning would be out of that, or it's not really how we would perceive internal comms. So, so then I went back into my mind and thought of places that I've been and things that I've done. And some of these probably reflect as much on me and my team, or colleagues, as, as anyone else, but lessons I've learned. So, again, I was relaying this to my colleague this morning, and it's going to sound really, really silly, but I'm, it has an important message, so, so hear me out. So I worked in an organisation that had about, and if, if this is all you take away, after all of that talking and stuff, if you take away the examples, then that's probably some pretty good learning. So I worked in an organisation with about 2,000 people and about four different offices across three cities in New Zealand. Okay, <coughs> big crisis, lots of drama, lots of people started really quickly, just everything was a bit chaotic. And so we did these surveys, you know, like once a month or once a quarter, I can't remember. And we said, so tell us, tell us at the end, you know, Freefield, what could we be doing different? What could we be doing that would make things better for you? What's missing for you? Just, just share it. We'll, we'll, if we don't know, we can't help you. So we're sitting and reading these results to, to present back to the CE and this Four or five times, there aren't enough forks. The same four or five times people said, there are, there, there are no forks in, my, in our kitchen, in one of them. There's no forks on level six, none at all. I don't know where they've gone, I don't know if no one ever bought any forks, but there are no forks, I can't eat my lunch. I have to eat my lunch with a spoon, it's really annoying. <laughs> so everyone's kind of, you know, we met back to the sea, and he's, you know, all this very strategic stuff, and, and the fork comment, and he's like, why don't, why don't we just buy some forks? Like, uh, it doesn't seem, that, doesn't seem that difficult. Everyone's like, yeah, okay, okay, we'll go buy some forks, cool. I don't know if it was just one of those things when everyone thought it was someone else's job, but obviously no one bought forks, or if they did, they didn't buy enough. So, next year they come out, still no bloody forks, where are the forks? So, long story short, actually I don't know if the fork situation was ever resolved, because I, I don't know if you've ever worked in big organisations, there's almost never forks at lunchtime, right? Like, people eat them, they put them in their desk, they put them in the dishwasher, I don't know what they do with them, but... So there's a fork issue, resolved or unresolved, remains to be seen, but I guess the message I'm trying to, not that you have to buy forks to be good at internal comms, but what that sends to people is, I've asked for your, for your opinion, I haven't listened to it, which is one, you know, that's one big issue, but the even bigger issue is, if you as an organisation can't satisfy my basic human needs, like enabling me to eat my lunch, 
then is this really a kind of organisation where my opinion would be heard or if I blew the whistle on something that was wrong where I'd be taken seriously. And actually it sends a whole raft of other kind of messages and questions that leave people thinking, hmm, I'm not sure this is the right place for me. Um, another example, so um, the staff first example. So yeah, always go back to your offices, check the, check the fork drawer, buy some forks. People will love you for it. Quick one. Um, uh, staff first, so telling people, people first. So I've got two examples of this, one where people were told first and one where people weren't. And um, the first was uh, one organisation that I worked in where a woman had, so a woman had sent in some details saying that her, I'm trying to do this tactfully without, well, it's public information so it's neither here nor there, but um, had sent in that she needed a, the service that she was being provided to be having its address changed. And so, they, and, and effective immediately. So we said, yep, that's fine. And someone, human error or otherwise, I don't know, sent out a letter that says, Mrs. Jones, thank you very much for your phone call. Um, your, your services will now be provided to this address effective immediately. And they send it to her old address. And this is a little bit of a, it's quite a sad story really, but this woman had um, been a victim of rape at the hands of her ex-husband and was being stalked and abused and all sorts of hideous things. So they had left their house and moved to a new address specifically to get away from him and he was checking their mailbox and found this. So then they had to move house a second time, probably fifth time for them by this point. So the first we heard about it was through the media. So a newspaper rang us and said, we've had a, someone come to us and explain what's happened. Does beg the question why you'd go straight to the media instead of to an organisation to rectify it. That's a question we'll never know the answer of. Um, and they said this has happened. So of course the first thing we do is what can we do to fix it? So we contacted the police and women's refuge and we had a conversation about how, how this hasn't happened to us before, how do we fix and make this right for this woman? What's looking after her safety and wellbeing first? How do we fix that? So we're sitting in this kind of crisis meeting, fixing, fixing the situation as best we could, and um, I said we need to tell our people. And everyone's going, mm, no, no, I'm not sure we do. No, it's a, you know, it's a privacy, but mm, this feels a bit uncomfortable. I don't know if we should tell people. It's like, oh, it's a little bit uncomfortable, yeah, definitely. But we have a whole lot of people in the call centre who, when this goes to the papers, and it will, when this goes to the papers, they're going to get phone calls, and what are they going to say? Especially, what are they going to say if they don't even know about it? So this went back on the boards a few times, and eventually we went out, and it was as simple as a sort of four or five line message that said, this thing has happened, it will appear in tomorrow's paper. This is what we're doing about it. We've dealt with this. this is a very private situation. There's not a lot we can share. This is why. Again, this is telling the why, why you can't tell people things. It's pretty obvious why we can't. Um, our priority is on um, making things right for the customer and making sure that she's safe. Um, and sure enough, you know, first thing someone does when they see it on the front page of the paper, even if they're not ringing to have a gripe, the first thing they do when they're ringing because they were ringing about their bill anyway is say, oh, we're just seeing a story on the front page of the paper this morning. But at least by that point, Everyone in the organisation knew what had happened, and they knew that yes, it was a very unfortunate um, event, and um, you know our, our focus really is on the safety and well-being of the woman or the, the customer at the centre of this. So it was in the paper with all sorts of far more factual details. They could have deduced more from the newspaper article than what the person on the phone said, which is probably the best place to be. But actually, at least we had something to say. Um, and. The flip side of that, same, same organisation actually, where staff weren't told first, um, was about a sale, when a sale was being proposed by a parent company. And there was rumours in, in the, the industry publication saying this sale was coming up, and to the untrained eye, myself included, I was like, what does that mean? Does it mean I'm going to have a job or no job? Like, what, what, what kind of impact is there if the company is sold by a parent company? Does, does someone else buy it and we just carry on as, as, as normal? And um, in a session, someone asked the CEO or relevant GM, <coughs> so there's these rumours, what, what's the story? And they said, nope, nope, no, we've got no, nothing, don't know anything about that, no, no certainty, just rumours. Until three days later, when an article was published with quotes from the parent company saying, <coughs> yes, in fact, we are selling. And, and the, the in, interesting thing, I guess, that we took out of that was actually it was a really good thing. So they could have told us that, for, you know, I'm not saying that they knew, but the response might have been something like, so there are some rumours going around. We're not privy to actually what the actual plans of the parent company are, we're not part of them, but if it were to go ahead, this is what that could look like, and actually it's a really good thing. 
because it means we're more independent, we have more ability to make our own decisions, we don't have to report into a parent company, we can choose how we do business for ourselves. It's a really good thing and no, the business will continue to operate the way that it is. So no one's losing any jobs, all the C's and GM's will stay where they are. It's just a different uh, stakeholder structure, shareholder structure. But they said nothing. And so of course, everyone first sees this in an article and goes, oh, I haven't got a job, what's happening? Big panic. But actually, only three days earlier, that could have been alleviated with just, this is what we do know, this is what we don't know. And as soon as we know more, or we're in a position to tell you more, we will. Again, making a commitment to go back to people when you can, and going back to them. So 